You're listening to Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in Season 3 of Weekend Reads, we will be making our way through the 1922 abridgment of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. You can visit MidwestCovencast.com to find podcast extras, including a free online copy of the text. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on Patreon for access to additional materials, like a serialized official Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads ebook with additional notes about the text and some editorial modernizations straight from, well, me. Now, Coven, it is time to cozy up with your coffee or tea and enjoy this episode of Weekend Reads. Chapter 21 Tabooed Things. Subsection 1. The Meaning of Taboo Thus, in primitive society, the rules of ceremonial purity observed by divine kings, chiefs, and priests agree in many respects with the rules observed by homicides, mourners, women in childbed, girls at puberty, hunters and fishermen, and so on. To us, these various classes of persons appear to differ totally in character and condition. Some of them we should call holy— Others we might pronounce unclean and polluted. But the savage makes no such moral distinction between them. The conceptions of holiness and pollution are not yet differentiated in his mind. To him, the common feature of all these persons is that they are dangerous and in danger, and the danger in which they stand and to which they expose others is what we should call spiritual or ghostly, and therefore imaginary. The danger, however, is not less real because it is imaginary, Imagination acts upon man as really as does gravitation, and may kill him as certainly as a dose of prussic acid. To seclude these persons from the rest of the world, so that the dreaded spiritual danger shall neither reach them nor spread from them, is the object of the taboos which they have to observe. These taboos act, so to say, as electrical insulators to preserve the spiritual force with which these persons are charged from suffering or inflicting harm by contact with the outer world. To the illustrations of these general principles, which have been already given, I shall now add some more, drawing my examples first from the class of tabooed things, and second from the class of tabooed words, for in the opinion of the savage both things and words may, like persons, be charged or electrified, either temporarily or permanently, with the mysterious virtue of taboo, and may, therefore, require to be banished for a longer or a shorter time from the familiar usage of common life." And the examples will be chosen with special reference to those sacred chiefs, kings, and priests who, more than anybody else, live fenced about by taboo as by a wall. Tabooed things will be illustrated in the present chapter, and tabooed words in the next. Subsection 2. Iron Tabooed In the first place, we may observe that the awful sanctity of kings naturally leads us to prohibition to touch their sacred persons. Thus, it was unlawful to lay hands on the person of a Spartan king. No one might touch the body of the king or queen of Tahiti. It is forbidden to touch the person of the king of Siam, under pain of death. And no one may touch the king of Cambodia, for any purpose whatever, without his express command." In July 1874, the king was thrown from his carriage and lay insensible on the ground, but not one of his suite dared to touch him. A European coming to the spot carried the injured monarch to his palace. Formerly, no one might touch the king of Korea, and if he deigned to touch a subject, the spot touched became sacred, and the person thus honored had to wear a visible mark, generally a cord of red silk, for the rest of his life. Above all, no iron might touch the king's body. In 1800, King Tieng Song Tai Ong died of a tumor in the back. No one dreaming of employing the lancet, which would probably have saved his life. It is said that one king suffered terribly from an abscess in the lip, till his physician called in a jester, whose pranks made the king laugh heartily, and so the abscess burst. Roman and Sabine priests might not be shaved with iron, but only with bronze razors or shears, and whenever an iron graving tool was brought into the sacred grove of the Arval brothers at Rome for the purpose of cutting an inscription in stone, an expiatory sacrifice of lamb and pig must be offered, which was repeated when the graving tool was removed from the grove. As a general rule, iron might not be brought into Greek sanctuaries. In Crete, sacrifices were offered to Menedemus without the use of iron, because the legend ran that Menedemus 
had been killed by an iron weapon in the Trojan War. The Archon of Pladia might not touch iron, but once a year, at the annual commemoration of the men who fell at the Battle of Plataea, he was allowed to carry a sword, wherewith to sacrifice a bull. To this day, a hot and hot priest never uses an iron knife, but always a sharp splints of quartz in sacrificing an animal or circumcising a lad. Among the Ovambo of southwest Africa, custom requires that lads should be circumcised with a sharp flint. If none is to hand, the operation may be performed with iron, but the iron must afterwards be buried. Among the Moquis of Arizona, stone knives, hatchets, and so on have passed out of common use, but are retained in religious ceremonies. After the Pawnees had ceased to use stone arrowheads for ordinary purposes, they still employed them to slay the sacrifices, whether human captives or buffalo and deer. Amongst the Jews, no iron tool was used in building the temple at Jerusalem or in making an altar. The old wooden bridge, Pons Sublicius, at Rome, which was considered sacred, was made and had to be kept in repair without the use of iron or bronze. It was expressly provided by law that the temple of Jupiter Liber, at Firfo, might be repaired with iron tools. The council chamber at Syzicus was constructed of wood without any iron nails the beams being so arranged that they could be taken out and replaced. This superstitious objection to iron perhaps dates from the early time in the history of society when iron was still a novelty, and as such was viewed by many with suspicion and dislike. For everything new is apt to excite the awe and dread of the savage. It is a curious superstition, says a pioneer in Borneo, this of the Jasuns, to attribute anything, whether good or bad, lucky or unlucky, that happens to them to something novel which has arrived in their country. For instance, my living in Kindrum has caused the intensely hot weather we have experienced of late. The unusually heavy rains, which happened to follow the English survey of the Nicobar Islands in the winter of 1886 through 1887, were imputed by the alarmed natives to the wrath of the spirits at the theodolites, dumpy levelers, and other strange instruments, which had been set up in so many of their favorite haunts, and some of them proposed to soothe the anger of the spirits by sacrificing a pig. In the 17th century, a succession of bad seasons excited a revolt among the Estonian peasantry, who traced the origin of the evil to a watermill, which put a stream to some inconvenience by checking its flow. The first introduction of the iron plowshares into Poland, having been followed by a succession of bad harvests, the farmers attributed the badness of the crops to the iron plowshares and discarded them for the old wooden ones. To this day, the primitive Badawis of Java, who live chiefly by husbandry, will use no iron tools in tilling their fields. The general dislike of innovation, which always makes itself strongly felt in the sphere of religion, is sufficient by itself to account for the superstitious aversion to iron entertained by kings and priests and attributed to them to the gods. Possibly this aversion may have been intensified in places by some such accidental cause as the series of bad seasons, which cast discredit on iron plowshares in Poland. But the disfavor in which iron is held by the gods and their minister has another side. Their antipathy to the metal furnishes men with a weapon which may be turned against the spirits when occasion serves, as their dislike of iron is supposed to be so great that they will not approach persons and things protected by the obnoxious metal. Iron may obviously be employed as a charm for banning ghosts and other dangerous spirits and often it is so used. Thus, in the highlands of Scotland, the great safeguard against the elfin race is iron, or better yet, steel. The metal in any form, whether as a sword, a knife, a gun barrel, or what not, is all-powerful for this purpose. Whenever you enter a fairy dwelling, you should always remember to stick a piece of steel, such as a knife, or a needle, or a fish hook, in the door, for then the elves will not be able to shut the door till you come out again." So, too, when you have shot a deer and are bringing it home at night, be sure to thrust a knife into the carcass, for that keeps the fairies from laying their weight on it. A knife or nail in your pocket is quite enough to prevent the fairies from lifting you up at night. Nails in the front of a bed ward off elves from women in the straw and from their babes. But to make quite sure, it is better to put the smoothing iron under the bed and the reaping hook in the window. If a bull has fallen over a rock and been killed, a nail stuck into it will preserve the flesh from the fairies. Music discoursed on a Jew's harp keeps the elfin women away from the hunter. 
because the tongue of the instrument is of steel. In Morocco, iron is considered a great protection against demons. Hence, it is usual to place a knife or dagger under a sick man's pillow. The Singalis believe that they are constantly surrounded by evil spirits who lie in wait to do them harm. A peasant would not dare to carry good food, such as cakes or roast meat, from one place to another without putting an iron nail on it to prevent a demon from taking possession of the viands and so making the eater ill. No sick person, whether man or woman, would venture out of the house without a bunch of keys or a knife in his hand, for without such a talisman, he would fear that some devil might take advantage of his weak state to slip into his body. And if a man has a large sore on his body, he tries to keep a morsel of iron on it as a protection against demons. On the slave coast, when a mother sees her child gradually wasting away, she concludes that a demon has entered into the child and takes her measures accordingly. To lure the demon out of the body of her offspring, she offers a sacrifice of food, and while the devil is bolting it, she attaches iron rings and small bells to her child's ankles and hangs iron chains around his neck. The jingling of the iron and tinkling of the bells are supposed to prevent the demon, when he has concluded his repast, from entering again into the body of the little sufferer. Hence, many children may be seen in this part of Africa weighed down with iron ornaments. Subsection 3 sharp weapons tabooed. There is a priestly king in the north of Zengui in Burma, revered by the Sauti as the highest spiritual and temporal authority, into whose house no weapon or cutting instrument may be brought. This rule may perhaps be explained by a custom observed by various peoples after a death. They refrain from the use of sharp instruments, so long as the ghost of the deceased is supposed to be near, lest they should wound it. Thus, among the Eskimo of Bering Strait, during the day on which a person dies in the village, no one is permitted to work, and the relatives must perform no labor during the three following days. It is especially forbidden during this period to cut with any edged instrument, such as a knife or an axe, and the use of pointed instruments, like needles or bodkins, is also forbidden. This is said to be done to avoid cutting or injuring the shade, which may be present at any time during this period and, if accidentally injured by any of these things, it would become very angry and bring sickness or death to the people. The relatives must also be very careful at this time not to make any loud or harsh noises that may startle or anger the shade. We have seen that in like manner, after killing a white whale, these Eskimo abstain from the use of cutting or pointed instruments for four days, lest they should unwittingly cut or stab the whale's ghost. The same taboo is sometimes observed by them when there is a sick person in the village, probably from a fear of injuring his shade, which may be hovering outside of his body. After a death, the Romanians of Transylvania are careful not to leave a knife lying with the sharp edge uppermost, so long as the corpse remains in the house or else the soul will be forced to ride on the blade. For seven days after a death, the corpse being still in the house, the Chinese abstain from the use of knives and needles, and even of chopsticks, eating their food with their fingers. On the third, sixth, ninth, and fortieth days after the funeral of the old Prussians and Lithuanians used to prepare a meal to which, standing at the door, they invited the soul of the deceased. At these meals they sat silent round the table, and used no knives, and the women who served up the food were also without knives. If any morsel fell from the table, they were left lying there for the lonely souls that had no living relations or friends to feed them. When the meal was over, the priest took a broom and swept the souls out of the house, saying, Dear souls, ye have eaten and drunk, go forth." Go forth. We may now understand why no cutting instrument may be taken into the house of the Burmese pontiff. Like so many priestly kings, he is probably regarded as divine, and it is therefore right that his sacred spirit should not be exposed to the risk of being cut or wounded whenever it quits his body to hover invisible in the air or to fly on some distant mission. Subsection 4. Blood Tabooed. We have seen that the flamen dialis was forbidden to touch or even name raw flesh. At certain times, a Brahmin teacher is enjoined not to look on raw flesh, blood, or persons whose hands have been cut off. In Uganda, the father of twins is in a state of taboo for some time after birth. Among other rules, he is forbidden to kill anything or to see blood. 
in the Pelu Islands when a raid has been made on a village and a head carried off. The relations of the slain man are tabooed and have to submit to certain observances in order to escape the wrath of his ghost. They are shut up in the house, touch no raw flesh, and chew betel over which an incantation has been uttered by the exorcist. After this, the ghost of the slaughtered man goes away to the enemy's country in pursuit of his murderer. The taboo is probably based on the common belief that the soul or spirit of the animal is in the blood, as tabooed persons are believed to be in a perilous state. For example, the relations of the slain man are liable to the attacks of his indignant ghost. It is especially necessary to isolate them from contact with spirits. Hence, the prohibition to touch raw meat. But as usual, the taboo is only the special enforcement of a general precept. In other words, its observance is particularly enjoined in circumstances which seem urgently to call for its application. But apart from such circumstances, the prohibition is also observed, though less strictly, as a common rule of life. Thus, some of the Estonians will not taste blood because they believe that it contains the animal's soul, which would enter the body of the person who tasted the blood. Some Indian tribes of North America, through a strong principle of religion, abstain in the strictest manner from eating the blood of any animal, as it contains the life and spirit of the beast. Jewish hunters poured out the blood of the game they had killed and covered it up with dust. They would not taste the blood, believing that the soul or life of the animal was in the blood, or actually was the blood. It is a common rule that royal blood may not be shed upon the ground. Hence, when a king or one of his family is to be put to death, a mode of execution is devised by which the royal blood shall not be spilt upon the earth. About the year 1688, the generalissimo of the army rebelled against the king of Siam and put him to death. After the manner of royal criminals, or as princes of the blood, are treated when convicted of capital crimes, which is by putting them into a large iron cauldron and pounding them into pieces with a wooden pestle, because none of their royal blood must be spilt on the ground, it being, by their religion, thought great impiety to contaminate the divine blood by mixing it with earth. When Kublai Khan defeated and took his uncle Nayan, who had rebelled against him, he caused Nayan to be put to death by being wrapped in a carpet and tossed to and fro till he died, because he would not have the blood of his line imperial spilt upon the ground or exposed in the eye of heaven and before the sun. Friar Rikold mentions the Tartar maxim, one Khan will put another to death to get possession of the throne, but he takes great care that the blood be not spilt. For they say, it is highly improper that the blood of the great Khan should be spilt upon the ground. So they cause the victim to be smothered somehow or other. The like feeling prevails at the court of Burma, where a peculiar mode of execution without bloodshed is reserved for princes of the blood. The reluctance to spill royal blood seems to be only a particular case of a general unwillingness to shed blood, or at least to allow it to fall on the ground. Marco Polo tells us that in his day, persons caught in the streets of Cambalock, Peking, at unreasonable hours, were arrested, and if found guilty of a misdemeanor, were beaten with a stick. Under this punishment, people sometimes die, but they adopt it in order to shoot bloodshed, for their boxes say that it is an evil thing to shed man's blood. In West Sussex, people believe that the ground on which human blood has been shed is accursed and will remain barren forever. Among some primitive peoples, when the blood of a tribesman has to be spilt, it is not suffered to fall upon the ground, but is received upon the bodies of his fellow tribesmen. Thus, in some Australian tribes, boys who are being circumcised are laid on a platform formed by the living bodies of the tribesmen, and when a boy's tooth is knocked out, as an initiatory ceremony, he is seated on the shoulders of a man, on whose breast the blood flows and may not be wiped away. Also, the Gauls used to drink their enemies' blood and paint themselves therewith. So also they write that the old Irish were wont, and so have I seen some of the Irish do, but not their enemies, but friends' blood, as namely, at the execution of a notable traitor at Limerick called Murrow O'Brien, I saw an old woman, which was his foster mother, take up his head whilst he was quartered, and suck up all the blood that ran thereout, saying that the earth was not worthy to drink it, and therewith also steeped her face and breast and tore her hair, crying out and shrieking most terribly. Among the Latuka of Central Africa, the earth on which a drop of blood has fallen at childbirth is carefully scraped up 
with an iron shovel, put into a pot along with the water used in washing the mother, and buried tolerably deep outside the house on the left-hand side. In West Africa, if a drop of your blood has fallen on the ground, you must carefully cover it up, rub, and stamp it into the soil. If it has fallen on the side of a canoe or a tree, the place is cut out and the chip destroyed. One motive of these African customs may be a wish to prevent the blood from falling into the hands of magicians who might make an evil use of it. That is admittedly the reason why people in West Africa stamp out any blood of theirs which has dropped on the ground, or cut out any wood that has been soaked with it. From a like dread of sorcery, natives of New Guinea are careful to burn any sticks, leaves, or rags which are stained with their blood, and if the blood has dripped on the ground, they turn up the soil, and if possible, light a fire on the spot. The same fear explains the curious duties discharged by a class of men called Ramanga, or Blue Blood, among the Bastilio of Madagascar. It is their business to eat all the nail parings and to lick up all the spilt blood of the nobles. When the nobles pare their nails, the parings are collected to the last scrap and swallowed by the Ramanga. If the parings are too large, they are minced small and so gulped down. Again, should a nobleman wound himself, say, in cutting his nails or treading on something, the Ramunga lick up the blood as fast as possible. Nobles of high rank hardly go anywhere without these humble attendants. But if it should happen that there are none of them present, the cut nails and spilt blood are carefully collected to be afterwards swallowed by the Ramunga. There is scarcely a nobleman of any pretensions who does not strictly observe this custom, the intention of which probably is to prevent these parts of this person from falling into the hands of sorcerers who, on the principles of contagious magic, could work him harm thereby. The general explanation of the reluctance to shed blood on the ground is probably to be found in the belief that the soul is in the blood, and that therefore any ground on which it may fall necessarily becomes taboo or sacred. In New Zealand, anything upon which even a drop of a high chief's blood chances to fall becomes taboo or sacred to him. For instance, a party of natives, having come to visit a chief in a fine new canoe, the chief got into it, but in doing so a splinter entered his foot and the blood trickled on the canoe, which at once became sacred to him. The owner jumped out, dragged the canoe ashore opposite the chief's house, and left it there. Again, a chief, in entering a missionary's house, knocked his head against a beam, and the blood flowed. The natives said that in former times, the house would have belonged to the chief. As usually happens with taboos of universal application, the prohibition to spill the blood of a tribesman on the ground applies with peculiar stringency to chiefs and kings, and is observed in their case long after it has ceased to be observed in the case of others. Subsection 5. The Head Tabooed Many peoples regard the head as peculiarly sacred. The special sanctity attributed to it is sometimes explained by a belief that it contains a spirit, which is very sensitive to injury or disrespect. Thus, the Yorubas hold that every man has three spiritual inmates, of whom the first, called Alori, dwells in the head and is the man's protector, guardian, and guide. Offerings are made to the spirit, chiefly of fowls, and some of the blood mixed with palm oil is rubbed on the forehead. The Karens suppose that a being called the So resides in the upper part of the head, and while it retains its seat, no harm can befall the person from the efforts of the seven Kellis, or personified passions. But if the So becomes heedless or weak, certain evil to the person is the result. Hence, the head is carefully attended to, and all possible pains are taken to provide such dress and attire as will be pleasing to the So. The Siamese think that a spirit called Kwan, or Kun, dwells in the human head, of which it is the guardian spirit. The spirit must be carefully protected from injury of every kind. Hence, the act of shaving or cutting the hair is accompanied with many ceremonies. The Kun is very sensitive on points of honor, and would feel mortally insulted if the head in which he resides were touched by the hand of a stranger. The Cambodians esteem it a grave offense to touch a man's head. Some of them will not enter a place where anything whatever is suspended over their heads, and the meanest Cambodian would never consent to live under an inhabited room. Hence, the houses are built of one story only, and even the government respects the prejudice by never placing a prisoner in the stocks under the floor of a house, though the houses are raised high above the ground. 
The same superstition exists among the Malays, for an early traveler reports that in Java, people wear nothing on their heads and say that nothing must be on their heads. And if any person were to put his hand upon their head, they would kill him. And they do not build houses with stories in order that they may not walk over each other's heads. The same superstition as to the head is found in full force throughout Polynesia. Thus of Gadanua, a Marquesan chief, it is said that to touch the top of his head or anything which had been on his head was sacrilege. To pass over his head was an indignity never to be forgotten. The son of a Marquesan high priest has been seen to roll on the ground in agony of rage and despair, begging for death because someone had desecrated his head and deprived him of his divinity by sprinkling a few drops of water on his hair. But it was not the Marquesan chiefs only whose heads were sacred. The head of every Marquesan was taboo and might neither be touched nor stepped over by another. Even a father might not step over the head of his sleeping child. Women were forbidden to carry or touch anything that had been in contact with or had merely hung over the head of their husband or father. No one was allowed to be over the head of the king of Tonga. In Tahiti, anyone who stood over the king or queen or passed his hand over their heads might be put to death until certain rites were performed over it. A Tunisian infant was especially taboo. Whatever touched the child's head while it was in this state became sacred and was deposited in a consecrated place, railed in for the purpose at the child's house. If a branch of a tree touched the child's head, the tree was cut down, and if in its fall it injured another tree, so as to penetrate the bark, that tree also was cut down as unclean and unfit for use. After the rites were performed, the special taboos ceased, but the head of a Tunisian was always sacred. He never carried anything on it, and to touch it was an offense. So sacred was the head of a Maori chief that, if he only touched it with his fingers, he was obliged immediately to apply them to his nose and snuff up the sanctity which they had acquired by the touch, and thus restore it to the part from whence it was taken." On account of the sacredness of his head, a Maori chief could not blow the fire with his mouth, for the breath being sacred communicated his sanctity to it, and a brand might be taken by a slave or a man of another tribe, or the fire might be used for other purposes, such as cooking, and so cause his death. Subsection 6. Hair Tabooed when the head was considered so sacred that it might not even be touched without grave offense, it is obvious that the cutting of the hair must have been a delicate and difficult operation. The difficulties and dangers which, on the primitive view, beset the operation are of two kinds. There is first the danger of disturbing the spirit of the head, which may be injured in the process and may revenge itself upon the person who molests him. Secondly, there is the difficulty of disposing of the shorn locks, for the savage believes that the sympathetic connection, which exists between himself and every part of his body, continues to exist, even after the physical connection has been broken, and that therefore he will suffer from any harm that may befall the several parts of his body, such as the clippings of his hair or the parings of his nails. Accordingly, he takes care that these severed portions of himself shall not be left in places where they might either be exposed to accidental injury or fall into the hands of malicious persons who might work magic on them to his detriment or death. Such dangers are common to all, but sacred persons have more to fear from them than ordinary people. So the precautions taken by them are proportionately stringent. The simplest way of evading the peril is not to cut the hair at all. And this is the expedient adopted, where the risk is thought to be more than usually great. The Frankish kings were never allowed to crop their hair. From their childhood upwards, they had to keep it unshorn. To pull the long locks that floated on their shoulders would have been to renounce their right to the throne. When the wicked brothers Clotaire and Childebert covered the kingdom of their dead brother Clodomir, they unveiled into their power their little nephews, the two sons of Clodomir, and having done so, they sent a messenger bearing scissors and a naked sword to the children's grandmother, Queen Clotilde at Paris. The envoy showed the scissors and the sword to Clotilde, and bade her choose whether the children should be shorn and live or remain unshorn and die. The proud queen replied that if her grandchildren were not to come to the throne, she should rather see them dead than shorn and murdered they were by their ruthless uncle Clotaire with his own hand. The king of Ponape, one of the Caroline Islands, must wear his hair long, and so must his grandees. 
Among the Hoes, a tribe of West Africa, there are priests on whose head no razor may come during the whole of their lives. The god who dwells in the man forbids the cutting of his hair on pain of death. If the hair is at last too long, the owner must pray to his god to allow him at least to clip the tips of it. The hair is, in fact, conceived as the seat and lodging place of his god, so that were it shorn, the god would lose his abode in the priest. The members of a Maasai clan, who are believed to possess the art of making rain, may not pluck out their beards, because the loss of their beards would, it is supposed, entail the loss of their rain-making powers. The head chief and the sorcerers of the Maasai observe the same rule for a like reason. They think that were they to pull out their beards, their supernatural gifts would desert them. Again, men who have taken a vow of vengeance sometimes keep their hair unshorn till they have fulfilled their vow. Thus, of the Marquesans, we are told that occasionally they have their head entirely shaved, except one lock on the crown, which is worn loose or put up in a knot. But the latter mode of wearing the hair is only adopted by them when they have a solemn vow as to revenge the death of some near relation, etc. In such case, the lock is never cut off until they have fulfilled their promise. A similar custom was sometimes observed by the ancient Germans. Among the Chati, the young warriors never clipped their hair or their beard till they had slain an enemy. Among the Tarajas, when a child's hair is cut to rid it of vermin, some locks are allowed to remain on the crown of the head as a refuge for one of the child's souls. Otherwise, the soul would have no place in which to settle, and the child would sicken. The Karabataks are much afraid of frightening away the soul of a child. Hence, when they cut its hair, they always leave a patch unshorn, to which the soul can retreat before the shears. Usually, this lock remains unshorn all through life, or at least up till manhood. Subsection 7. Ceremonies at Haircutting But when it becomes necessary to crop the hair... Measures are taken to lessen the dangers which are supposed to attend the operation. The chief of Nemozi in Fiji always ate a man by way of precaution when he had had his hair cut. There was a certain clan that had to provide the victim, and they used to sit in solemn council among themselves to choose him. It was a sacrificial feast to avert evil from the chief. Amongst the Maoris, many spells were uttered at hair cutting. One, for example, was spoken to consecrate the obsidian knife with which the hair was cut. Another was pronounced to avert the thunder and lightning, which hair cutting was believed to cause. He who has had his hair cut is in immediate charge of the Atua spirit. He is removed from the contact and society of his family and his tribe. He dare not touch his food himself. It is put into his mouth by another person, nor can he for some days resume his accustomed occupations or associate with his fellow men. The person who cuts the hair is also tabooed. His hands, having been in contact with a sacred head, he may not touch food with them or engage in any other employment. He is fed by another person with food cooked over a sacred fire. He cannot be released from the taboo before the following day, when he rubs his hands with a potato or a fern root, which has been cooked on a sacred fire. And this food, having been taken to the head of the family in the female line and eaten by her, his hands are freed from the taboo. In some parts of New Zealand, the most sacred day of the year was that appointed for hair cutting. The people assembled in large numbers on that day from all the neighborhood. Subsection 8 disposal of cut hair and nails. But even when the hair and nails have been safely cut, there remains the difficulty of disposing of them, for their owner believes himself liable to suffer from any harm that may befall them. The notion that a man may be bewitched by means of clippings of his hair, the parings of his nails, or any other severed portion of his person is almost worldwide, and attested by evidence too ample, too familiar, and too tedious in its uniformity to be here analyzed at length. The general idea on which the superstition rests is that if the sympathetic connection supposed to persist between a person and everything that has once been part of his body or in any way closely related to him, a very few examples must suffice. They belong to the branch of sympathetic magic, which may be called contagious. Dread of sorcery, we are told, formed one of the most salient characteristics of the Marquesan Islanders in the old days. The sorcerer took some of their hair, spittle, or other bodily refuse of the man he wished to injure, wrapped it up in a leaf, and placed the packet in a bag woven of threads or fibers, which were knotted in an intricate way. 
The whole was then buried with certain rites, and thereupon the victim wasted away of a languishing sickness, which lasted twenty days. His life, however, might be saved by discovering and digging up the buried hair, spittle, or what not. For as soon as this was done, the power of the charm ceased. A Maori sorcerer, intent on bewitching somebody, sought to get a tress of his victim's hair, the parings of his nails, some of his spittle, or a shred of his garment. Having obtained the object, whatever it was, he chanted certain spells and curses over it in a falsetto voice, and buried it in the ground. As the thing decayed, the person to whom it had belonged was supposed to waste away. When an Australian blackfellow wishes to get rid of his wife, he cuts off a lock of her hair in her sleep, ties it to his spear thrower, and goes with it to a neighboring tribe, where he gives it to a friend. His friend sticks the spear thrower up every night before the campfire, and when it falls down, it is a sign that the wife is dead. The way in which the charm operates was explained to Dr. Howitt by a weird jury man. You see, he said, when a black fellow doctor gets hold of something belonging to a man and roasts it with things and sings over it, the fire catches hold of the smell of the man, and that settles the poor fellow. The Huzzles of the Carpathians imagine that if mice get a person's shorn hair and make a nest of it, the person will suffer from headache or even become idiotic. Similarly, in Germany, it is a common notion that if birds find a person's cut hair and build their nests with it, the person will suffer from headaches. Sometimes it is thought that he will have an eruption on the head. The same superstition prevails, or used to prevail, in West Sussex. Again, it is thought that the cut or combed out hair may disturb the weather by producing rain and hail, thunder and lightning. We have seen that in New Zealand, a spell was uttered at hair cutting to avert thunder and lightning. In the Tyrol, witches are supposed to use cut or combed out hair to make hailstones or thunderstorms with. Flinkeet Indians have been known to attribute stormy weather to the rash act of a girl who had combed her hair outside of the house. The Romans seem to have held similar views, for it was maxim with them that no one on shipboard could cut his or her nails except in a storm, that is, when the mischief was already done. In the highlands of Scotland, it is said that no sister should comb her hair at night if she have a brother at sea. In West Africa, when the Mani of Chitombe or Jumba died, the people used to run in crowds to the corpse and tear out his hair, teeth, and nails, which they kept as a rain charm, believing that otherwise no rain would fall. The Makoko of the Anzikos begged the missionaries to give him half their beards as a rain charm. If cut hair and nails remain in sympathetic connection with the person from whose body they have been severed, it is clear that they can be used as hostages for his good behavior by anyone who may chance to possess them. For on the principles of contagious magic, he has only to injure the hair or nails in order to hurt simultaneously their original owner. Hence, when the Nandi have taken a prisoner, they shave his head and keep the shorn hair as a surety that he will not attempt to escape. But when the captive is ransomed, they return his shorn hair with him to his own people. To preserve the cut hair and nails from injury, and from the dangerous uses to which they may be put by sorcerers, it is necessary to deposit them in some safe place. The shorn locks of a Maori chief were gathered with much care and placed in an adjoining cemetery. The Tahitians buried the cuttings of their hair at the temples. In the streets of Soku, a modern traveler observed cairns of large stones piled against walls with tufts of human hair inserted in the crevices. On asking the meaning of this, he was told that when any native of the place pulled his hair, he carefully gathered up the clippings and deposited them in one of these cairns all of which were sacred to the fetish and therefore invaluable. These cairns of sacred stones, he further learned, were simply a precaution against witchcraft, for if a man were not thus careful in disposing of his hair, some of it might fall into the hands of his enemies, who would by means of it be able to cast spells over him and so compass his destruction. When the top knot of a Siamese child has been cut with great ceremony, the short hairs are put into a little vessel made of plantain leaves and set adrift on the nearest river or canal. As they float away, all that was wrong or harmful in the child's disposition is believed to depart with them. The long hairs are kept till the child makes a pilgrimage to the holy footprint of Buddha on the sacred hill at Prabhat. They are then presented to the priests, who are supposed to make them into brushes with which they sweep the footprint. 
But in fact, so much hair is thus offered every year that the priests cannot use it all, so they quietly burn the superfluity as soon as the pilgrims' backs are turned. The cut hair and nails of the Flamindialis were buried under a lucky tree. The shorn tresses of the Vestal Virgins were hung on an ancient lotus tree. Often the clipped hair and nails are stowed away in any secret place, not necessarily in a temple or cemetery or at a tree, as in the cases already mentioned. Thus, in Swabia, you are recommended to deposit your clipped hair in some spot where neither sun nor moon can shine on it, for example, in the earth or under a stone. In Danzig, it is buried in a bag under the threshold. In Yugi, one of the Solomon Islands, men bury their hair lest it should fall into the hands of an enemy who would make magic with it, and so bring sickness or calamity on them. The same fear seems to be general in Melanesia, and has led to regular practice of hiding cut hair and nails. The same practice prevails among many tribes of South Africa, from a fear lest wizards should get a hold of the severed particles and work evil with them. The Caffreys carry still further this dread of allowing any portion of themselves to fall into the hands of an enemy, for not only do they bury their cut hair and nails in a secret spot, but when one of them cleans the head of another, he preserves the vermin which he catches, carefully delivering them to the person to whom they originally appertained, supposing, according to their theory, that as they derived their support from the blood of the man from whom they were taken, should they be killed by another, the blood of his neighbor would be in his possession, thus placing in his hands the power of some superhuman influence. Sometimes the severed hair and nails are preserved, not to prevent them from falling into the hands of a magician, but that the owner may have them at the resurrection of the body, to which some races look forward. Thus the Incas of Peru took extreme care to preserve the nail parings and the hairs that were shorn off or torn out with a comb placing them in holes or niches in the walls and if they fell out any other indian that saw them picked them up and put them in their places again i very often asked different indians at various times why they did this in order to see what they would say and they all replied in the same words saying know that all persons who are born must return to life they have no word to express resurrection and the souls must rise out of their tombs with all that belong to their bodies we therefore in order that we may not have to search for our hair and nails at a time when there will be much hurry and confusion place them in one place that they may be brought together more conveniently and whenever it is possible we are also careful to spit in one place similarly the turks never throw away the parings of their nails but carefully stow them in cracks of the walls or of the boards in the belief that they will be needed at the resurrection the armenians do not throw away their cut hair and nails and extracted teeth but hide them in places that are esteemed holy such as a crack in the church wall a pillar of the house or a hollow tree they think that all these severed portions of themselves will be wanted at the resurrection, and that he who has not stowed them away in a safe place will have to hunt about for them on the great day. In the village of Drumkenrand in Ireland, there used to be some old women who, having ascertained from scripture that the hairs of their heads were all numbered by the Almighty, expected to have to account for them at the day of judgment. In order to be able to do so, they stuffed the severed hair away in the thatch of their cottages some people burn their loose hair to save it from falling into the hands of sorcerers this is done by the patagonians and some of the victorian tribes in the upper vosges they say that you should never leave the clippings of your hair and nails lying about but burn them to hinder the sorcerers from using them against you for the same reason italian women either burn their loose hairs or throw them into a place where no one is likely to look for them the almost universal dread of witchcraft induces the West Africans, the Makololo of South Africa, and the Tunisians to burn or bury their shorn hair. In the Tyrol, many people burn their hair lest the witches should use it to raise thunderstorms. Others burn or bury it to prevent the birds from lining their nests with it, which would cause the heads from which the hair came to ache. The destruction of the hair and nails plainly involves an inconsistency of thought. The object of the destruction is avowedly to prevent these severed portions of the body from being used by sorcerers, but the possibility of their being so used depends upon the supposed sympathetic connection between them and the man from whom they were severed. And if this sympathetic connection still exists, clearly these severed portions cannot be destroyed without injury to the man. Subsection 9 spittle tabooed 
The same fear of witchcraft, which has led so many people to hide or destroy their loose hair and nails, has induced other or the same people to treat their spittle in a like fashion. For on the principles of sympathetic magic, the spittle is part of the man, and whatever is done to it will have a corresponding effect on him. A Chalote Indian, who has gathered up the spittle of an enemy, will put it in a potato and hang the potato in the smoke, uttering certain spells as he does so in the belief that his foe will waste away as the potato dries in the smoke. Or he will put the spittle in a frog and throw the animal into an inaccessible, unnavigable river, which will make the victim quake and shake with ague. The natives of Urawera, a district of New Zealand, enjoyed a high reputation for their skill in magic. It was said that they made use of people's spittle to bewitch them. Hence visitors were careful to conceal their spit, lest they should furnish these wizards with a handle for working them harm. Similarly, among some tribes of South Africa, no man will spit when an enemy is near, lest his foe should find the spittle and give it to a wizard, who would then mix it with magical ingredients so as to injure the person from whom it fell. Even in a man's own house, his saliva is carefully swept away and obliterated for a similar reason. If common folk are thus cautious, it is natural that kings and chiefs should be doubly so. In the Sandwich Islands, chiefs were attended by a confidential servant bearing a portable spittoon, and the deposit was carefully buried every morning to put it out of the reach of sorcerers. On the slave coast, for the same reason, whenever a king or chief expectorates, the saliva is scrupulously gathered up and hidden or buried. The same precautions are taken, for the same reason, with the spittle of the chief of Tabali in southern Nigeria. The magical use to which spittle may be put marks it out, like blood or nail parings, as a suitable material basis for a covenant, since by exchanging their saliva, the covenanting parties give each other a guarantee of good faith. If either of them afterwards forswears himself, the other can punish his perfidy by a magical treatment of the perjurer's spittle, which he has in his custody. Thus, when the Wayaga of East Africa desire to make a covenant, the two parties will sometimes sit down with a bowl of milk or beer between them, and after uttering an incantation over the beverage, they each take a mouthful of the milk or beer and spit it into the other's mouth. In urgent cases, when there is no time to spend on ceremony, the two will simply spit into each other's mouth, which seals the covenant just as well. Subsection 10. Foods Tabooed. As might have been expected, the superstitions of the savage cluster thick about the subject of food, and he abstains from eating many animals and plants, wholesome enough in themselves, which for one reason or another he fancies would prove dangerous or fatal to the eater. Examples of such abstinence are too familiar and far too numerous to quote. But if the ordinary man is thus deterred by superstitious fear from partaking of various foods, the restraints of this kind, which are laid upon sacred or tabooed persons, such as kings and priests, are still more numerous and stringent. We have already seen that the flamen dialis was forbidden to eat or even name several plants and animals, and that the flesh diet of Egyptian kings was restricted to veal and goose. In antiquity, many priests and many kings of barbarous people abstained wholly from a flesh diet. The Gungas, or fetish priests of the Loango coast, are forbidden to eat or even see a variety of animals and fish, in consequence of which their flesh diet is extremely limited. Often they live only on herbs and roots, though they may drink fresh blood. The heir to the throne of Luongo is forbidden from infancy to eat pork. From early childhood, he has interdicted the use of the cola fruit in company. At puberty, he is taught by a priest not to partake of fowls, except such as he has himself killed and cooked. And so, the number of taboos goes on, increasing with his years. In Fernando Po, the king, after installation, is forbidden to eat cocoa, arum acule, deer, and porcupine, which are the ordinary foods of the people. The head chief of the Maasai may eat nothing but milk, honey, and the roasted livers of goats, for if he partook of any other food, he would lose his power of soothsaying and of compounding charms. Subsection 11. Knots and Rings Tabooed we have seen that among the many taboos which the Flamandialis at Rome had to observe, there was one that forbade him to have a knot on any part of his garments, and another that obliged him to wear no ring unless it were broken. 
In like manner, Muslim pilgrims to Mecca are in a state of sanctity or taboo and may wear on their persons neither knots nor rings. These rules are probably of kindred significance and may conveniently be considered together. To begin with knots, many people in different parts of the world entertain a strong objection to having any knot about their person at certain critical seasons, particularly childbirth, marriage, and death. Thus, among the Saxons of Transylvania, when a woman is in travail, all knots on her garments are untied, because it is believed that this will facilitate her delivery, and with the same intention, all the locks in the house, whether on doors or boxes, are unlocked. The laps think that a lying-in woman should have no knot on her garments, because a knot would have the effect of making the delivery difficult and painful. In the East Indies, this superstition is extended to the whole time of pregnancy. The people believe that if a pregnant woman were to tie knots or braid or make anything fast, the child would thereby be constricted or the woman would herself be tied up when her time came. Nay, some of them enforce the observance of the rule on the father as well as the mother of the unborn child. Among the sea dyaks, neither of the parents may bind up anything with a string to make anything fast during the wife's pregnancy. In the Tuambula tribe of North Celebes, a ceremony is performed in the fourth or fifth month of a woman's pregnancy, and after it her husband is forbidden, among many other things, to tie any fast knots and to sit with his legs crossed over each other. In all these cases, the idea seems to be that the tying of a knot would, as they say in the East Indies, tie up the woman, in other words, impede and perhaps prevent her delivery or delay her convalescence after the birth. On the principles of homeopathic or imitative magic, the physical obstacle or impediment of a knot on a cord would create a corresponding obstacle or impediment in the body of the woman. That this is really the explanation of the rule appears from a custom observed by the hoes of West Africa at a difficult birth. When a woman is in hard labor and cannot bring forth, they call in a magician to her aid. He looks at her and says, the child is bound in the womb. That is why she cannot be delivered. On the entreaties of her female relations, he then promises to loosen the bond so that she may bring forth. For that purpose, he orders them to fetch a tough creeper from the forest, and with it he binds the hands and feet of the sufferer on her back. Then he takes a knife and calls out the woman's name, and when she answers, he cuts through the creeper with a knife, saying, I cut through today thy bonds and thy child's bonds. After that, he chops up the creeper small, puts the bits in a vessel of water, and bathes the woman with the water. Here, the cutting of the creeper, with which the woman's hands and feet are bound, is a simple piece of homeopathic or imitative magic. By releasing her limbs from their bonds, the magician imagines that he simultaneously releases the child in her womb from the trammels which impede its birth. The same train of thought underlies a practice observed by some peoples of opening all locks, doors, and so on, while a birth is taking place in the house. We have seen that at such a time the Germans of Transylvania open all the locks, and the same thing is done also in Voigtland and Mecklenburg. In northwestern Agrilshire, superstitious people used to open every lock in the house at childbirth. In the island of Salset near Bombay, when a woman is in hard labor, all locks of doors or drawers are opened with the key to facilitate her delivery. Among the mandolings of Sumatra, the lids of all chests, boxes, pans, and so forth are opened, and if this does not produce the desired effect, the anxious husband has to strike the projecting ends of some of the house beams in order to loosen them, for they think that everything must be open and loose to facilitate the delivery. In Chittagong, when a woman cannot bring her child to the birth, the midwife gives orders to throw all doors and windows wide open, to uncork all bottles, to remove the bungs from all casts, to unloose the cows in the stall, the horses in the stable, the washdog in his kennel, to set free sheep, fowls, ducks, and so forth. This universal liberty accorded to the animals and even to inanimate things is, according to the people, an infallible means of ensuring the woman's delivery and allowing the babe to be born. In the island of Sakhalin, when a woman is in labor, her husband undoes everything that can be undone. He loosens the plaits of his hair and the laces of his shoes. Then he unties whatever is tied in the house or its vicinity. In the courtyard, he takes the axe out of the log in which it is stuck. He unfastens the boat. If it is moored to a tree, he withdraws the cartridges from his gun and the arrows from his crossbow. 
Again, we have seen that a Tumbula man abstains not only from tying knots, but also from sitting with crossed legs during his wife's pregnancy. The train of thought is the same in both cases. Whether you cross threads in tying a knot or only cross your legs in sitting at your ease, you are equally on the principles of homeopathic magic, crossing or thwarting the free course of things, and your action cannot but check and impede whatever may be going forward in your neighborhood. Of this important truth, the Romans were fully aware. To sit beside a pregnant woman or a patient under medical treatment with clasped hands, says the grave Pliny, is to cast a malignant spell over the person. And it is worse still if you nurse your leg or legs with your clasped hands, or lay one leg over the other. Such postures were regarded by the old Romans as a let and hindrance to business of every sort, and at a council of war or meeting of magistrates, at prayers and sacrifices, no man was suffered to cross his legs or clasp his hands. The stock instance of the dreadful consequences that might flow from doing one or the other was that of Alcmena, who traveled with Hercules for seven days and seven nights, because the goddess Lucina sat in front of the house with clasped hands and crossed legs and the child could not be born until the goddess had been beguiled into changing her attitude. It is a Bulgarian superstition that if a pregnant woman is in the habit of sitting with crossed legs, she will suffer much in childbed. In some parts of Bavaria, when conversation comes to a standstill and a silence ensues, they say, surely somebody has crossed his legs. The magical effect of knots in trammeling and obstructing human activity was believed to be manifested at marriage, not less than at birth. During the Middle Ages and down to the 18th century, it seems to have been commonly held in Europe that the consummation of marriage could be prevented by anyone who, while the wedding ceremony was taking place, either locked a lock or tied a knot in a cord, and then threw the lock or the cord away. The lock or the knotted cord had to be flung into water, and until it had been found and unlocked or untied, no real union of the married pair was possible. Hence, it was a grave offense not only to cast such a spell, but also to steal or make away with the material instrument of it, whether lock or knotted cord. In the year 1718, the Parliament of Bordeaux sentenced someone to be burned alive for having spread desolation through the whole family by means of knotted cords, and in 1705, two persons were condemned to death in Scotland for stealing certain charm knots which a woman had made, in order thereby to mar the wedded happiness of Spalding of a Shintily. The belief in the efficacy of these charms appears to have lingered in the highlands of Pertshire down to the end of the 18th century, for at that time it was still customary in the beautiful parish of Logiare between the river Tumel and the river Tay to unloose carefully every knot in the clothes of the bride and the bridegroom before the celebration of the marriage ceremony. We meet with the same superstition and the same custom at the present day in Syria. The persons who help a Syrian bridegroom to don his wedding garments take care that no knot is tied on them and no button buttoned, for they believe that a button buttoned or a knot tied would put it within the power of his enemies to deprive him of his nuptial rights by magical means. The fear of such charms is diffused all over North Africa at the present day. To render a bridegroom impotent, the enchanter has only to tie a knot in a handkerchief, which he had previously placed quietly on some part of the bridegroom's body when he was mounted on horseback ready to fetch his bride. So long as the knot in the handkerchief remains tied, so long would the bridegroom remain powerless to consummate the marriage. The maleficent power of knots may also be manifested in the infliction of sickness, disease, and all kinds of misfortune. Thus, among the hoes of West Africa, a sorcerer will sometimes curse his enemy and tie a knot in a stalk of grass, saying, I have tied up so-and-so in this knot. May all evil light upon him. When he goes into the field, may a snake sting him. When he goes to the chase, may a ravening beast attack him. And when he steps into a river, may the water sweep him away. When it rains, may the lightning strike him. May evil night be his. It is believed that in the knot the sorcerer has bound up the life of his enemy. In the Quran, there is an allusion to the mischief of those who puff into the knots, and an Arab commentator on the passage explains that the words refer to women who practice magic by tying knots in cords and then blowing and spitting upon them. He goes on to relate how, once upon a time, a wicked Jew bewitched the prophet Muhammad himself by tying nine knots on a string, which he then hid in a well. 
So the prophet fell ill, and nobody knows what might have happened if the archangel Gabriel had not opportunely revealed to the holy man the place where the knotted cord was concealed. The trusty Ali soon fetched the baleful thing from the well, and the prophet recited over it certain charms, which were specially revealed to him for the purpose. At every verse of the charms, a knot untied itself, and the prophet experienced a certain relief. If knots are supposed to kill, they are also supposed to cure. This follows from the belief that to undo the knots, which are causing sickness, will bring the sufferer to relief. But apart from this negative virtue of maleficent knots, there are certain beneficent knots to which a positive power of healing is ascribed. Pliny tells us that some folk cure diseases of the groin by taking a thread from a web, tying seven or nine knots on it, and then fastening it to the patient's groin. But to make the cure effectual, it was necessary to name some widow as each knot was tied. O'Donovan describes a remedy for fever employed among the Turcomans. The enchanter takes some camel hair and spins it into a stout thread, droning a spell the while. Next, he ties seven knots on the thread, blowing on each knot before he pulls it tight. This knotted thread is then worn as a bracelet on his wrist by the patient. Every day, one of the knots is untied and blown upon, and when the seventh knot is undone, the whole thread is rolled up into a ball and thrown into a river, bearing away, as they imagine, the fever with it. Again, knots may be used by an enchantress to win a lover and attach him firmly to herself. Thus, the lovesick maid in Virgil seeks to draw Daphnis to her from the city of spells, and by tying three knots on each of three strings of different colors. So an Arab maiden, who had lost her heart to a certain man, tried to gain his love and bind him to herself by tying knots in his whip. But her jealous rival undid the knots. On the same principle, magic knots may be employed to stop a runaway. In Swaziland, you may often see grass tied in knots at the side of the footpaths. Every one of these knots tells of a domestic tragedy. A wife has run away from her husband, and he and his friends have gone in pursuit, binding up the paths, as they call it, in this fashion to prevent the fugitive from doubling back over them. A net, from its affluence of knots, has always been considered in Russia very efficacious against sorcerers. Hence, in some places, when a bride is being dressed in her wedding attire, a fishing net is flung over her to keep her out of harm's way. For a similar purpose, the bridegroom and his companions are often girt with pieces of net, or at least with tight-drawn girdles, for before a wizard can begin to injure them, he must undo all the knots in the net, or take off the girdles. But often, a Russian amulet is merely a knotted thread. A skein of red wool, wound about the arms and legs, is thought to ward off agues and fevers, and nine skeins, fastened around a child's neck, are deemed a preservative against scarlatina. In the Tver government, a bag of a special kind is tied to the neck of the cow, which walks before the rest of a herd, in order to keep off wolves. Its force binds the maw of the ravening beast. On the same principle, a padlock is carried thrice round a herd of horses before they go afield in the spring, and the bearer locks and unlocks it as he goes, saying, I lock from my herd the mouths of the gray wolves, and this steel lock... Knots and locks may serve to avert not only wizards and wolves, but death itself. When they brought a woman to the stake at St. Andrews in 1572 to burn her alive for a witch, they found on her a white cloth like a collar with strings and many knots on the strings. They took it from her, sorely against her will, for she seemed to think that she could not die in the fire if only the cloth with the knotted strings was on her. When it was taken away, she said, "'Now I have no hope of myself.' In many parts of England, it is thought that a person cannot die so long as any locks are locked or bolts shot in the house. It is therefore a very common practice to undo all locks and bolts when the sufferer is plainly near his end, in order that his agony may not be unduly prolonged. For example, in the year 1863, at Taunton, a child lay sick of scarlatina, and death seemed inevitable. A jury of matrons was, as it were, impaneled, and to prevent the child dying hard, all the doors in the house, all the drawers, all the boxes, all the cupboards were thrown wide open, the keys taken out, and the body of the child placed under a beam, whereby a sure, certain, and easy passage into eternity could be secured. Strange to say, the child declined to avail itself of the facilities for dying, so obligingly placed at its disposal by the sagacity and experience of the British matrons of Taunton. It preferred to live rather than give up the ghost just then. 
The rule which prescribes that at certain magical and religious ceremonies, the hair should hang loose and the feet should be bare is probably based on the same fear of trammeling and impeding the action in hand, whatever it may be, by the presence of any knot or constriction, whether on the head or on the feet of the performer. A similar power to bind and hamper spiritual as well as bodily activities is ascribed by some people to rings. Thus, in the island of Carpathus, people never button the clothes they put upon a dead body, and they are careful to remove all rings from it. For the spirit, they say, can even be detained in the little finger and cannot rest. Here it is plain that even if the soul is not definitely supposed to issue at death from the fingertips, yet the ring is conceived to exercise a certain constrictive influence which detains and imprisons the mortal spirit in spite of its efforts to escape from the tabernacle of clay. In short, the ring, like the knot, acts as a spiritual fetter. This may have been the reason of an ancient Greek maxim attributed to Pythagoras, which forbade people to wear rings. Nobody might enter the ancient Arcadian sanctuary of the mistress at Lycosera with a ring on his or her finger. Persons who consulted the oracle Faunus had to be chaste, to eat no flesh, and to wear no rings. On the other hand, the same constriction which hinders the egress of the soul may prevent the entrance of evil spirits. Hence, we find rings used as amulets against demons, witches, and ghosts. In the Tyrol, it is said that a woman in childbed should never take off her wedding ring, or spirits and witches will have power over her. Among the laps, the person who is about to place a corpse in the coffin receives from the husband, wife, or children of the deceased a brass ring, which he must wear fastened to his right arm until the corpse is safely deposited in the grave. The ring is believed to serve the person as an amulet against any harm which the ghost might do to him. How far the custom of wearing finger rings may have been influenced by or even have sprung from a belief in their efficacy as amulets to keep the soul in the body or demons out of it is a question which seems worth considering. Here we are only concerned with the belief insofar as it seems to throw light on the rule that the Flamidialis might not wear a ring unless it were broken, taken in conjunction with the rule which forbade him to have a knot on his garments. It points to a fear that the powerful spirit embodied in him might be trammeled and hampered in its goings out and comings in by such corporeal and spiritual fetters as rings and knots. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. We will be back in two weeks with our next installment. In the meantime, you can catch up with our other pod, Midwest Covencast. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on our Patreon to gain access to additional content and exclusive coven merch. You can even join our coven by following us on social media at Midwest Covencast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. You can also keep up with us on our website, MidwestCovenCast.com. Until next time, Coven, blessed be.